Welcome to the latest installment of Rancho Das webcast series. Today's event on In the Dom, No One Will Hear You Scream. Brought to you by NetSparker, SITB, and Waxpress. So I am Sandeep Kamle, and I am today's moderator of the Rancho Das webcast series. Just a few, be just a few announcements before we begin. Scratch for Hackers, Rancho Das series. Webcast is designed to interact between you and presenter. And later in the event, you can submit your feedbacks regarding our event. So uh, there are a few, few announcements. We are using the Google Hangout tool for the webcast and all you have to open the YouTube live link and please close all unnecessary applications it will help you to save your bandwidth and it will run your YouTube connection properly so you can connect to our IRC channel there is an IRC channel called as hash G4H and you can ask any questions regarding uh, webcast or subject and by that is we have format that, that is in the bracket capital Q and in front of that capital Q, you can uh, ask, type your question. Okay. So, and the copy of the presentation and the recording will be uh, available after the presentation. Uh, if you're facing any difficulties while accessing the webcast, please contact on the IRC. So, who we are? So, Crash for Hackers. We are the info security community, and Garage for Hackers started in 2007 with the awkward view. So we had 899 members in the Garage for Hackers. So in the forum, we have found a lot of stuff bypassing the DEP and various other vulnerabilities. Some of our achievements currently, we are 4,000 plus users, 8,000 uh, 8, posts, and we found a lot of bug, including Google, Yahoo, Facebook in 2012 and 2013 in 2014 and we have a CEV 15 plus in the web browser such as Chrome, IE, Firefox and Safari and we have bypassed so we there is a event called as CanQuest and uh, we already submitted a lot of the disclosure to our forum and which is discussed in CanQuest so we contribute to a lot of web application we do uh, regular intro webcast series we do malware research these are the achievements and about the webcast so we are on presentation called in the dawn no one will hear you scream so presenting dr mario heritage he's a security researcher and he's a client side security expert founder of the cure 53 present a penetration testing company so you can find us on the page garageforhackers.com and uh, thanks for the, our team who are dedicatedly working toward this venture task event Hope you will join us on Twitter and Facebook. And now I'm handing over presentation over to more capable hands to the Dr. Mario Hedrich. Thank you. Mario, please. All right. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Is that all okay? Yep. Seems so. Excellent. So um, in the DOM, no one will hear you scream. And that's true. I tried it. No one can indeed hear you scream. Just some few words about me first. My name is Mario. I'm a researcher and a postdoctor at the Ruhr University in Bochum. Um, indeed, I founded a penetration testing firm that is located in Berlin. We do a lot of penetration security advice, mobile apps, client-side security, server-side security, and whatnot. I wrote some papers. I wrote some books. And I created some projects. And today, I am going to talk about the DOM. So what is the DOM? The DOM translates to the document object model. And we're going to talk about this. And we're going to especially talk about the weirder areas. We're going to talk about the origins and goals of the DOM. We're going to talk about the history of the DOM and the first implementations that were created back then. We're also going to talk about some traps and pitfalls and see where the DOM actually bites you in the ass. We're going to talk about some security issues related to the DOM. And we're also going to cover countermeasures against those security issues. And maybe if time will surface, we're also going to have like a small outlook and have a look at the future, what it's going to bring in terms of the DOM. What we're not going to talk about, so if you're hoping for this, uh, then you're wrong here, is about JavaScript weirdness. We are not going to talk about things like undefined equals equals null. Um, there's plenty of them, but we're not going to cover them between, because this talk is exclusively going to be about the DOM itself, the layer in between, the layer between the HTML and the JavaScript or whatever scripting language your user agent supports. 
Um, we're also not going to talk about JavaScript performance, about JavaScript memory leaks, or about any other things that have to do with JavaScript itself. It's just exclusively about the DOM. So to understand the DOM and what it is, we also have to kind of understand what the history is thereof. And uh, so for the first time, we're going to talk about the ancient history of the DOM. Like, how did it all begin? How did it all start? Well, DOM, as we know today, has, in fact, made a very long way. And the first baby steps were made as back as in early 1995. There was no real name for this thing back then. And no nowadays, this is more or less known as the legacy DOM or DOM level zero which is the fundamental parts of the DOM, like the fundamental glue between the JavaScript and the HTML. The first implementations that we could see and can still see of that very DOM back then were available in Netscape 2.0. I'm not really sure how many of the uh, viewers of this webcast are actually still in the age of having used Netscape 2.0. I am not, um, so I don't know how it looked back then, but it was certainly interesting. and. Uh, Implementations could also be seen, for example, MSIE3 and those very, very early browsers. But the problem was that there was no actual standard. There was just a need for a certain amount of interactivity for the HTML and to kind of glue it to the JavaScript or whatever scripting language was available back then. Um, but no one actually took the time to specify how this should be done. And, well, there was no reason to actually specify this because browser vendors back then majorly tried to gain market share and uh, slowly shifted into what we know today as the first browser wars. Documentation back then was poor. Um, there was no common denominator among browsers, so some browsers supported this, other browsers supported that, and other browsers supported nothing at all. And we saw first phenomena of things that are still haunting us today, for example, like the battle between JavaScript versus JScript. Many people do believe that JavaScript and JScript are the same, but they are not. There is fundamental, yet small and sometimes hard to discover differences, but they Exist. We're going to see some of them very soon. The DOM back then was fairly poor in features, and there was no such thing as an actual feature parity to HTML. Some goal that the DOM has today is, of course, to make sure that JavaScript can reach as much as possible in the HTML layer, in the CSS layer. Thus, we're talking about the sort of feature parity, but they didn't have it back then, and it was like very, very far away from that. So the goals of that very early DOM were actually interactivity, basic interactivity on the website, and easy element access, mainly targeted towards forms, because people wanted easier ways to actually make forms interactive and more usable. Forms, because forms suck, and they still suck, but the more usable they get, the less they suck, and that is quite good. We, for example, had back then the possibility to traverse into the document object, and then traverse into the forms collection, and then grab the first form and grab off that first form, the first elements, element and then interact with that and set the value or reset the value or something like that. We could also traverse into that directly and say document blah blah and for example have that form be called or be applied with the ID blah and that element be applied with the name blub and then we could access it directly which was pretty useful and you can see that it saves a lot of energy on traversing and tracing a lot of keystrokes and that is advantages. Um, websites back then were not really complex web applications, so they were basically documents that were offered that gave you information about things, and they were more or less kind of structured like a book, or close to being structured like a book, and it looked like this. There was no need for a lot of interactivity, but whatever was there was being used by the developers, so extensions were in sight and demands were in sight. What came up next was the intermediate DOM. And uh, this came directly after the so-called legacy DOM, and the year we're talking about is the year 1997. Still, the browsers in control back then was Microsoft Internet Explorer and Netscape, both running in version 4.0 and uh, subsequent micro uh, minor versions. The implementation back then was called the intermediate DOM, and both MSIE and Netscape placed their bets on DHTML, which we know today as dynamic HTML. So there was a bit more APIs to influence HTML via JavaScript, but still there was absolutely no standard in sight. And like I said earlier, why would they have a standard? It was a browser war anyway, and everybody tried to get micro chairs, so a standard would be not very productive for winning a browser war. What we were talking about back then in terms of numbers was essentially what is known today as DOM level zero plus, but I think no one actually says that anymore. It's just called the intermediate DOM, but still a niche in a niche and nothing too spectacular to be seen here, so let's move on to DOM level one. In the year 1998, DOM level one reached recommendation status. That means that there is someone recommending this, and this someone was an entity called or known as the W3C. 
So they had a look at this thing and they concluded that there is about time to kind of put some specification, some standardization in there and uh, said like, yeah, it's going to be slim, but it's better than nothing and we're going to do something and we recommend browser vendors to do it that way for the maximum amount of interoperability. Um, and you can see that there is like a lot of time that has been passing and about four years later something finally standards like emerges that is now called DOM level one. And it was already a bit bigger than the intermediate DOM, the documentation for the uh, DOM level zero, and it was structured in modules. So that was, for example, like a core component uh, that was covering all the basic interactions. There was an HTML module that was covering everything that has to do with the actual documentary. Um, they mainly dealt with naming conventions, whether things are uppercase, lowercase, case sensitive, and stuff like that. They were dealing with the document structure. They were also dealing with memory management. Um, they were working with processing instructions and specifying how they should look like, and so on and so on. The interfaces that they created back then were mainly defined via IDL, by the Interface Description Language. Today we know the web IDL. And you can see when I talk about, for example, processing instructions and stuff like that, that this whole thing is still very XML heavy. There's no trace of today's HTML and like modernized parsers and different parsers and so on. We see references to C data sections, to entities, to notations, and so on and so on. So the old DOM is very, very closely curated to XML. Um, there was, of course, not that much of conformity going on. And the question that can be raised here, what use is the standard if no one actually implements it? And the question then is, did browsers actually implement it? Nope, they did not. And as I said before, why would they? We had a browser war after all. So the results of that could be seen, for example, when having a look at the DOM that was present in Microsoft Internet Explorer, because it had a very, very useful object, or a very, very useful collection, and that was called Document All. But you wouldn't find it in any, of the, uh, in any other browser back then. In Netscape, however, they had a different idea. They were similarly great, and they said, for example, we should define a collection that is called Document Layers to provide people with the possibility of layering objects on top of each other and whatnot. One of the APIs that was indeed fairly spectacular was the inner HTML API. That was first seen in Microsoft Internet Explorer during these years. And developers, as well as browser vendors, said that this property is just like so awesome that we should definitely copy its behavior and implement it everywhere. This led to interesting artifacts, but this is not the topic of today. Um, but what was also implemented was, for example, ActiveX in these days. And we all, I guess, know how great that played out, or well that played out. And to my knowledge, the Mozilla Foundation and maybe even Netscape in the early years tried to kind of re-implement that as well to kind of catch ground. And they implemented something that is known as the Gecto ActiveX object. And I think meanwhile it's even gone again, so that didn't go so well. Another thing that Microsoft did back then was to not only add JavaScript to the mix, but implement like a completely different language that is also available from websites or in the browser itself, and that was Visual Basic Script, an amazingly grotesque language. MSIE 5 back then claimed to ship full DOM level 1 support, and it kind of did. But what it also did was just like shipping tons of extras and deviations as well, because the common consensus was back then to say the DOM is great and the standard is great, but those features are just simply not enough. We need more. Many of these deviations and extras are nowadays part of the standard, but back then they were not. And one of these details that we can have a look at is, for example, JavaScript versus JScript again. In our modern world, when we want to, for example, set the location to a different location in the DOM, then we call location.href equals, and then JavaScript alert for part one, for example, if we want to cause a cross-site scripting example. However, in IE, you can still do interesting things. You can, for example, also use the location object like a method. You can use it as a function. You can just go ahead and select location, opening parentheses, then throw a string in, then close the parentheses, and it would still work. It would not work in the edge mode of Internet Explorer, but it would work in IE 10 mode, IE 9 mode, IE 8 mode, and so on. And what this is, we're going to see later. Well, afterwards, we had DOM level 2. That was published none later than in the year 2000, again by the W3C. And we can have a look at the link, and we see the whole specification. And again, of course, it's being structured in modules. We have a core module, we have an HTML module, we have an events module, this is new. We have a style module, you can see, so there is like a direct connection to CSS and setting and retrieving those properties. There is a views module and whatnot. And you can see there is a good amount of separation between all those single satellite modules and to unite them all in one umbrella standard, which is DOM level 2. 
And DOM level 2 events is particularly interesting. We're going to see later on why. The changes between DOM level 2 and DOM level 1 were not the biggest ones. Um, one of them that I'm most worth mentioning is, for example, document get element by ID being available for all document types and not just for certain document types. Um, quick retraversal, direct access is now possible, and so on. And yes, as mentioned earlier, events, of course. So what we could do in DOM level 2, but what we couldn't do in DOM level 1 or even earlier versions was to just simply generate synthetic events by using document create event and say, like, hey, I want something keyboardish happen right now, and let's just like generate it in JavaScript or in DOM code and have it happen in the browser. Other than that, however, there was mostly stagnation. And um, well, the climate, as it feels when having a look at the older mailing list, decreased in quality over at the W3C because there was a high demand in dynamic features and more features and better features, but the W3C was just a little bit slow and didn't really come up with these. So what happened, in fact, was that developers and browser vendors wanted more, much, much more, and what they did was they just implemented this themselves. And this is really a good thing. Implementing stuff on your own, kind of deviating from the standard, rarely goes well. And to just prove you, provide you with a simple example, or just like actually a bunch of examples of what things were just so implemented back then by the browser vendors, let's have a look at what kind of, for example, MSIE5 provided us in terms of features. There was features like having direct access to the favorites, to the bookmarks. There was features like MHTML for, uh, for a multi-part uh, HTML, for data islands to talk to XML and have some basic templating, uh, XML HTTP requests, which we still do know today, XML data reduce, ActiveX, working draft XSL, media player interaction, toolbar, HTML actual applications, conditional compilation, active desktop, cursor capture, and so on and so on. There are so many features that were implemented back then that it's absolutely crazy. And some of these features are still there today. We still see, for example, vector markup language, Vermal. We see SAMI for subtitles, MIL for animation, CSS filters are kind of coming back. Page transitions were gone for a long time, but they're coming back. HTML plus time was available, uh, HTML components, tabular data controls. It was crazy. And as mentioned, many of those actually disappeared. Some stayed, and some were just a little bit transformed to kind of make more sense in a modern context and found their way back into the specifications, back into the browsers, back into the standards. Some of these features are directly available. Other of these features are hidden behind IE's document modes, so you kind of have to send the page into an older document mode to be able to use them. And little do people remember that IE back then even had its own Java virtual machine. So I don't even want to know what happens if you find that, but it's not available anymore. They discontinued that, luckily. So the fascinating thing behind that is that IE is doing or was doing something that was basically that is close to something that browser vendors do today. They came up with an idea. They kind of put some people together to kind of define the standard and the rules for this new feature. And then they basically said, like, yo, we have an intent to ship. And whoops, it was there. And that is really a good idea. But it took care for the web to develop, and it took care for things to move faster, and it took care for us to have features today that otherwise maybe we wouldn't have. Nowadays, we're talking about the DOM level 3. Well, it's not really nowadays. It's still 10 years old, but still we can say nowadays. The W3 was continuing to move slowly, very slowly, and DOM 3 as a standard, as a recommendation first, was meandering into a position of taking off and giving developers finally those features that they want. And it was specified back in 2004, which is kind of crazy because when I remember like two years back thinking about how many features of DOM level 3 are actually implemented in browsers, and I realized that it's not all of them and that it's still 10 years old, that is quite crazy. In that same year, in 2004, the WhatWG was created and gained ground. It was like a kind of split organization from the W3C that wanted more tempo and wanted things to happen faster. Is it a coincidence? Maybe not. But they kind of preached that it's not making any sense to be slow moving and that the processes of specification and standardization have to be quicker and have to be faster and more dynamic. What WG had some great ideas. Part of them was also what we know today is HTML5. And some other ideas were not so great. And one of the shittiest ideas, so excuse my French, was actually the invention of Web Forms 2.0, which was an absolutely horrific standard, which is not existing anymore. The documentation and the specification is still there. You can still have a look at that. But if you have a deep look at that, and you will realize that there's some crazy micro syntax in there to, for example, define how certain input elements and their values should mathematically interact with each other, that is crazy stuff. And no one except for Oprah dared to kind of support that and do anything with that. 
However, DOM3 DOM is still fairly XML heavy, so it didn't really make those transitions to HTML5 yet. We still see features to specifying XML serialization. There is XPath support and so on. And finally, 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 DOM level 3 has keyboard events because they were not so common back then. Um, another phenomenon of that time was what I like to call the rise of the triad. It was basically the rise of three UI and front end libraries back then. There was the library called Prototype. Many people might still know it. That was first released in 2005, and it was kind of a monkey patching. They were kind of coming up with the idea that it would be a great thing to extend the DOM to say, for example, hey, that array thing, that doesn't have enough features. I would actually go ahead and give it more features because I need it all the time. So they patched array, and they patched object, and certain other things. jQuery in its very beginnings, we're going to talk about jQuery later on, had a different approach. They said, like, yeah, we want to, we want to kind of solve the traversal problem. We want to make sure that it's easier to actually traverse to certain elements and work with them and keep developers from writing browser-specific code, because that was a nightmare. And then there was Moo Tools that was first released in September 2006 and was kind of bringing a little bit of OOP to JavaScript, extending the element constructors and extending the way HTML was perceived and addressable via the DOM. So we arrived at the year 2014, the DOM today. So we made like a big leap of 10 years. Let's have a look what the DOM today is, actually. So the DOM today is specified by the what W3C, uh, by, what, what, well, sorry, by the W3C and others, and it's known as DOM level 4. And also the what WG has a say in that and a bunch of other vendors. And it's kind of interesting because there are still several APIs that don't really fit any of these standards. So for example, if you have a look at window B2A or window A2B, then it's not really sure where this is coming from, where this is going. Um, and even in the specs itself, it says, like, this is not really part of any standard except, of course, here and there, but it's pretty cool. So most browser vendors actually implement it. So, and there's more of these kind of artifacts. Bottom line is we meanwhile have a bunch of DOMs. We have many DOMs, but one have one, uh, not all have one goal. And this goal is to be like a thorough and as feature complete as possible API between the structure and the logic or the document and the code. We have the HTML DOM that is specified as the given URLs. We have the SVG DOM, some also known as the Micro DOM, which is specified as the given URLs. PDFs have their own DOM if they're running Acrobat script. We have the XML DOM, of course, and even a MathML object has its own DOM. And there's a bunch of satellite specs that you can have a look at that also kind of work around the DOM, evolve around the DOM, and uh, have their importance in the DOM. Then there is also this bloody topic of JavaScript model view controller on my friend George, which basically says we have frameworks, and those frameworks are still hungry as developers are still hungry, and they want more features to the DOM. They are not happy with what is there yet, and they want more. They want templating, and they want shadow DOMs, and they want crazy things happening, and we don't have them yet, or they're slowly developing. So what those frameworks do are more or less gradually extending the DOM, extending HTML, but in the form of a JavaScript framework. And there's a lot of interesting security implications to that. And if you're interested in these, you might want to have a look at the JavaScript Model View Controller Security Project and see what kind of bugs exist there. Um, if you're into Angular, JS, Sandbox bypasses, this might be your place. But now let's actually get to the topic. We've seen how the DOM developed. We've seen in which direction the DOM developed. We've also seen that people still don't have enough. They would still want more. The DOM is still not yet powerful enough, so they create these frameworks. and uh, we also see that the DOM, meanwhile, has a fairly huge API. There's a lot of stuff going on. If you open your browser, if you open Firebug or whatever you debugger you prefer, and you, for example, say console dear window and have a look what's coming back then, that is a lot of stuff. Or if you, for example, go ahead and simply iterate over all the properties in window, you will see that there's hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of properties offering you different services from the standard element traversal up to camera access, speech synthesis, uh, speech recognition, and whatever you can imagine. What we're going to see now, however, is not a gallery of horrors of these new features, but we're going to talk about those parts in the DOM where now you can actually hear you scream, because that's the title of this very talk, and where and how you can find those behaviors that are risky, how they might affect your application security, and what you can do about them. And we're going to also have a look at a small old day for illustration of when those features actually bite you in the ass. So one big problem of that DOM is that it has a lot of possibilities to turn strings into executed code. Most of the programming languages have operators or functions or methods or constructs of doing that.
CSS that is leading to an XSS via the legacy CSS expressions, be it via HTML that is being written into the document directly, and so on. And the result thereof is usually DOM XSS. Now, I attempted to create a small list of these to just like get myself up to par with what is there and what kind of features we can, for example, use when attacking a web application or testing a web application for security flaws. And there is many of them. So first, of course, we have the document exe command API. Then we have element style CSS text, which we're talking about expressions. We have the location, uh, uh, the location property in the DOM that is kind of magic. So you can assign stuff. You can also call it as a function. As already mentioned, it has child properties that allow you to do the same. It has functions that can be called like replace and assign. We have document.url that you can use to reload the page in older versions of Internet Explorer or older document modes of Internet Explorer. And again, you have an XSS. We have location protocol, which, if you're smart, you can turn into an XSS as well by just like assigning JavaScript as the location protocol. We have the navigate method, exact script. We had, because it has been removed, crypto generate CRMF request. We have the possibility to execute or to create contextual fragment, document write, document write tool, open show model dialog, modeless dialog, and so on and so on. Then we have tons of properties that we can assign stuff to, like for example, element source, href form action data source, dot movie value to on set attribute, and so on and so on and so on. We have the classics eval, the classic evals that we know, functions, set time, set interval, set intermediate, MS set intermediate. We have the inner HTML, outer HTML API, inner text. If you, for example, use a script element or something similar and assign inner text, you might have an effect. Outer text, text content, text, and so on and so on. And then, of course, there's jQuery. And Can you still hear me? Someone tells me that I cannot be heard. That is bad. Can you hear me again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can. I can hear you now. OK, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Your uh, please Did you lose me on your presentation? All fine. Huh? Can you please turn on your presentation? I cannot see your presentation. OK, it is on. Can you see it? No. All right, let me try again. And technology. Um, Can you see the presentation again? Yeah. Excellent. Where did you lose me? Did you lose me here? Yeah. You can start from here. Excellent. OK. So I'm starting here. Is that OK? Yeah, sure. Sorry. OK, perfect. So let's talk about DOM clobbering. We just saw many, many, many properties that we can use in the DOM to turn strings into actually executed code. But this is not what we're going to talk about today, because there's something more interesting. And as mentioned, it's called DOM clobbering. And it's not that well known of an attack technique, and it's not that every single pen test yields a DOM clobbering bug. But many do, and they're kind of hidden in the code, and they kind of depend on how your code is looking and what the browser is contributing to that. So if the stars are aligned well, this attack technique will give you interesting results. And like I said already, um, the, cur the, the term was originally coined, as far as I remember, by Gareth. And uh, I think the first person who blogged about this in a security sense was me in 2008 or later, like 2008, after reading an interesting blog or interesting website that some of you might still remember under the name gibbering.com. And gibbering.com was one of these knowledge bases back then that was kind of documenting common errors in the DOM and JavaScript and providing ways of kind of getting around them. And gibbering.com was describing something that is known as unsafe names for HTML form controls. And you can find it under the URL given here. And that feature, 
that unsafe names for HTML form controls is the very, very essence of the attack technique DOM clobbering. So let's have a look at this. Um, gibbering says, browsers also may add names and IDs of other elements as properties to document and sometimes to the global object, or in parentheses, or an object above the ob global object in scope. And the next paragraph says, this non-standard behavior can result in replacement of properties on other objects. The problems it causes are discussed in detail. Well, you can look for this detail, and there's not too much of a detail. But we're going to have a look at these details now. Because if you see what's written here, that some elements can have an ID, and then they will overwrite something that is already there, that sounds bad, and that sounds fishy, and we should have a look at that. So DOM clobbering basically means the following. Imagine you have a form. And imagine that form has an input element. And imagine that form has an ID, and we call that ID foo. And that input element also has an ID, and we call that ID bar. And then we take a script element, and inside the script element, we alert the variable foo. And you would say, like, hey, wait, this should give you like an unknown error, an undefined error, because we don't we never declared the variable foo. We never initialized this. So it cannot really be here. But it still is, and it's the form. And then we alert alert foo bar. And again, you would say, man, this thing should be empty. There shouldn't be anything here. However, there is something, and it is, in fact, the input element. Because if you take an element of a certain kind, such as, for example, form or input, and you apply it with an ID or, in some situations, with a name attribute, then a variable slash reference will automatically be created in the DOM to be enabling you easy access to this element and save you from all the code that you would regularly use for traversal. Well, that is interesting, but not too spectacular. Let's have a look at a different example. Here we create a form. This form has an ID, and it has a blah fuzzle attribute that we set to X, Y, Z. It also has an action attribute that we set to A, B, C. And then we close the form. We open the script element, and then we alert foo.blahfuzzle. And it says, like, nah, I don't, I don't have this. I don't have this thing. This is, not, this is not defined. Too bad for us. But then we alert foo.action. And it's there. It's actually the action of the form. So we kind of we kind of realize something here. And what we realize is that we cannot arbitrarily create things in the DOM by just giving out ID attributes and names to forms and form elements. We can only do that for things that the form already knows. So the form doesn't know a blah fuzzle, but the form does know an action. Of course, it has an action attribute in the namespace, in the specification. So we can create that and alert that, and then the variable is there. Well. You might ask yourselves, OK, then this whole thing is not so really really useful, because we have a very low bandwidth of things we, that we can actually do. And we might as well just move on. But that is not the case, not in Microsoft Internet Explorer, one of many people's favorite browsers, because there we can also introduce children by using unknown attributes. So we can go ahead and say form blah fuzzle equals something, action equals something, and then that blah fuzzle thing is there. And that is very, very interesting. The only thing that you have to do in this particular situation is make sure that the page that you play this on, that you try this on, is being loaded in one of the older document modes. It will not work in the edge mode, so you have to set that page into one of the older document modes. Um, we do know, meanwhile, that it's possible for an attacker to place that page into an older document mode, even if that page itself is running in edge mode. And that is very interesting. Let's have a look at this example. The first example on the left side, we see form ID equals ABC. And then we say def equals 1, 2, 3. And then we go down and say alert abc def. There's a typo, sorry for that. Um, we will realize that this is not going to work, because IE will, by default, load this HTML snippet in edge mode. And in edge mode, this does not happen. However, if we create another page, and this page contains a meta element, and this meta element is setting IE, or is forcing IT, IE to render that page that we created in the compatibility mode for IE8, and then we create an iframe, and then we point to the page that we want to clobber, that we want to play with, that basically contains the example on the left, then it will work. Because in one of the older modes, it will work. And by using a page that is loaded in one of the older modes that we control, and iframe another page that we don't control, we can force that other page to run into, inside this other document mode. And that is good. We kind of documented that thoroughly in our paper on Q53DE slash XFO click checking PDF. So if you want to have a closer look at that and see more examples, have a look at that link. But this is fundamentally important because we learn that we can force IE into different document modes, even on pages that we don't control. And what this kind of means 
is, well, it's kind of clear what that means because we all of a sudden have the possibility to influence arbitrary stuff that is existing in the DOM, and that means cross-site scripting, and that's bad. So now let's have a look at how we can turn this into a successful cross-site scripting attack because it's not that really easy. And let's first think about what our limitations are, how far we can go, and how far we cannot go. So we can, for example, go ahead and create a form on the left top and say ID equals blafazl, and then we alert blafazl, and then this works. If we, however, declare this variable or even fill this variable with a value afterwards in the second example, then it will not work because we cannot override what's already there, especially if it's declared afterwards. The same holds, for example, if we use the var keyword, and the same, for example, is when we, for example, pass the value in as an argument for a function on the bottom right side. But if you have a look at the top right side, um, if we don't pass it in as an argument and we still use the reference, then it again will work. It will again give us back the form and not say undefined, and that is interesting. So what attackers can do right now is use harmless HTML to severely influence the DOM because we, do, we can do crazy stuff with that if you keep thinking what the potential of this kind of feature is then it's very, very interesting because we can override arbitrary stuff, even child properties. We can create new properties, new child properties, override existing ones, and uh, the only thing that must not be the case is that they have not been initialized. So that means if you try to override things in existing JavaScript business logic that has been written by a human or generated by a tool, then you have to be lucky and someone has to have forgotten to initialize the variable and then you can do it. But if you're talking about properties that have already been there, like for example native host objects, then it gets really interesting. I'm just asking in case, do we still have a connection? Is still everything good? Yes? No complaints? Good. So let's have a look at what our good friend Microsoft Internet Explorer does. What Microsoft Internet Explorer does in particular situations is this. We have a form element and we give the form an ID. And this time the ID is not foo or something that we just came up with. We just say that the ID is document. And then we give the form attribute that is called cookie and we set it to one, two, three. And then we create the script element and we say, hey, alert document cookie. Now guess what document cookie is? Document cookie is indeed the value one, two, three. Because document is pointing to that form and cookie is pointing to the attribute of that form and the value is being alerted. And that is pretty messed up. The second example is even more messed up because we create a form, we give it the ID location, so we overwrite the location object, then we get an href attribute that is not known for forms, and we set that href attribute to JavaScript alert one. Then we go down and we alert location href, which we assume to be sane, which we assume to be trustable because usually we cannot just assign stuff to that thing. And in fact, then location href will indeed be JavaScript alert one. And that is pretty bad because if you have, for example, a tracking script or anything else that relies on the fact of location href being trustable and being not just overridable by anyone, that is bad because now all of a sudden it is. You can use harmless static markup to override existing host objects in the DOM. And that's not a good thing. So now the question is, can we go ahead and use this for an actual attack? Let's think about this. We have learned that we can create arbitrary references in window. Um, in IE, we can even override existing stuff. In other browsers, we can't necessarily override existing stuff, but we can at least create new stuff. And I wanted to know if there is something public, something commonly used, where we can actually exploit that. And there is, or better to say, there was, because we reported that bug and then they fixed it. And that software was the fairly well-known uh, software called CK Editor, which is a rich text editor that is fairly popular. And one has to say that those guys who are maintaining these things have a pretty good attitude about their own uh, software. So they say, for example, that it's the best web text editor for everyone. And it has world-class quality, and it has high, high standards of quality as well. And I think with this level of modesty, someone with a security background has to have a look, and I did. And uh, while it is a bit hard to show you the demo right now, I'm providing you with the actual code of the attack. So what I was using as a demo, or what I was using as the attack, is to simply have a page on that same domain, maybe even produced by this rich text editor, that contains a link. And that link does have nothing evil to it. So every single server-side filter would say, like, yeah, that's actually a cool link. I can, I can deal with that. Nothing bad here. No on error or something like that, or on click or whatnot. And we watch that link, and we see that, for example, it has the classic anchor, and it has an href attribute. And it's at this href attribute, we have definitely something that looks like a relative URL. And it is. It's pointed to plugins, preview, preview HTML, and then it has something attached 
with the hash and everything that is behind the hash is not going to be seen by the server, but it can be accessed via location hash, for example. And we see that there's an SVG behind that hash, but that doesn't really hurt. I mean, that doesn't execute anything just so. Then we see that there's an ID attribute, and that ID attribute kind of looks interesting because we see underscore CKE underscore HTML to load. And that's it for now. And then we see that there's a target attribute, and we set this target attribute to underscore blank. And then it said something about dolphins because everybody likes dolphins. And the interesting thing is when you click that link in a certain browser, then that link will lead you to that page, plugins, preview, preview HTML, opened in a new window, and it will execute the alert. Now the question is, why is that? And what's, what does that have to do with DOM clobbering? So here is the vulnerable code. And that is, in fact, the code that resides in plugins, preview, preview HTML. So we see a script element. And the script element is not doing much. It's just basically creating a copy of document. And then it's calling document open. Then it's calling document write. And it says window.opener.underscore.cke underscore HTML to load. Then it says doc close. Then it says delete window opener CKE HTML to load, which is irrelevant for us. Relevant for us is the bolded line in the document write. And we have to ask ourselves, how is it possible to execute code with that? Well, it's easy. If you have a look at the code before, you will see that we have a link. And that link is actually applied with an ID. But that link is also being applied with a target attribute. And the target is saying underscore blank. So that means that a new window opens. Whenever one page opens another page, then that other page will have an object in its DOM that is called opener. So we cannot control window, but we can control opener, because we are opener. We are the page that opens that other page. And that thing takes from opener the property underscore CKE underscore HTML to load. And the good thing is that this property we can also control because we just take that link, we give it an ID with that very name, and that means that the DOM on that page is creating a variable, a reference to that link. And now the magic part comes. Because usually when you do DOM clobbering, you only get a reference to that very element, and you cannot really do anything with just that element reference. What you can do, however, with links, and that is how links are special, once they are being passed along as an object, and then an implicit two-string operation happens. So something turns that object into a string, which we're doing here with document write, then not the object itself will be serialized, but the href attribute, the content of the href attribute. That means that we don't see something like HTML anchor element in rectangular brackets, but we see the actual href attribute, and that href attribute is then being passed to document write. And that is very interesting, because that gives us the possibility to go back and have a look at href again and see that it's pointed to plugins, preview, preview HTML, SVG, or not alert one. Wait a second, that is our payload. So this content of the href attribute is actually being passed into document right, and that is bad. But we can't always exploit that. There are situations where we cannot, because browsers are pretty interesting when it comes to encoding the child properties of the location property. In Firefox, for example, that attack would not work, because in Firefox, the href attribute of the link when being serialized or being accessed as a string is being encoded. Every part of the URL is being encoded. So the opening, of, like the lesser than or the greater than of the HTML payload we passed in would be turned into percent %3c and percent %3e. And that doesn't give us anything. So we don't have an attack. However, on Chrome, some parts of the URL are not being encoded. That means that we theoretically could carry out the attack on Chrome, because the HTML special chars would still be there, not be encoded, and would be reflected on that page in this particular situation, and the SVG tag would be rendered. But the problem is Chrome's access S filter is pretty smart. And Chrome's access S filter even notices that there is an attack, that there is something fishy going on, and blocks the attacks. It's like, hey, no, wait a second. There is something in the URL even though it's just like part of the location hash. And there is something in the page that looks exactly like the stuff in the URL, so I'm not going to execute that. Absolutely not. Well, good for Chrome. So what you need in this particular situation is not a simple vector as we used here. You just need Chrome XSS filter bypass, and there is still a bunch of them. So it is possible. However, the attack works fine on IE, because IE's XSS filter is a bit different. I'm not saying it's stupid. I'm just saying it's less smart. And what I mean with that is that in some situations, it doesn't detect the attack because it thinks it's actually legit. And this particular situation is happening when the 
page that is orinate, originating the attack vector is leading to a page on the very same domain. So once the server, uh, the, the fur is on the very same origin as the attack page, then the filter is not going to be active and not going to say that this is an attack. And this goes to the possibility to carry out the attack because the RTE would usually create that link on the same domain. And once we click that link, we are still on the same domain and then calling or activating or opening a document again on the same domain as part of the editor plugins and thereby making sure that there's no cross-origin cross origin interaction, and that way we can easily execute the payload, and it's going to work, because IE doesn't encode, and same domain attacks are no attacks. And that is quite interesting, and we have a situation where we can execute and uh, abuse DOM clobbering for an actual attack. Now, the fix was easy, because the fix was simply to make sure that everything that you get in, in terms of data, that you do not really know, you need to check for type, you need to check for validity, so what the developers did in this particular situation is just like adding two lines and checking if that thing is actually a string. Because if it's not a string, then it's potentially an object. And that means that someone tampered with it and something is fishy, so they should not do it. And that's how they fixed the problem, and it's gone now. But you can see that this is a fairly nice example to illustrate that situations where the stars are actually aligned right. I know you might say, well, this is very esoteric, and this is almost never happening. So does that even make any sense to have a further look at this? Yes, it does. We could see that there is one potential security problem coming to these things. Um, and the biggest problem here is that we don't really have any instances or any software or any libraries that allow us to filter properly. We do have great anti-XSS libraries on the server. We have the HTML purifier, we have safe HTML, we have anti-semi, and a bunch of other projects that are really, really good. But we don't have anything in the browser. And that was like purely client-side problem. It was based on the browser-side feature and attacking the browser and using the browser as a transport medium. So no server involved, because we're constantly only using location hash. So in MSIE, we have two static HTML, which is quite good. Um, we have a bunch of XSS filters in the browser, as mentioned before. MSIE has one uh, that didn't predict us here. We have the XSS filter and WebKit and Blink. We have NoScript, which is also supplying us with a good XSS filter. And there's a bunch of hacks and wacks we can use to kind of protect ourselves from XSS in the browser, but there's not too much there. And I was thinking, well, we need something, because there's more and more applications that actually rely on working browser-based, client-only XSS filtering. And there is nothing there that really works well. So my thought was, why not build something? Can't be so hard, right? Can't be so complicated. So I started to write my own browser-based client-side XSS filter. And I decided to call it DOM Purify. And I just decided to kind of think that this might be a solution. We need this new tool. There's a lot of, lot of scenarios where we need this tool. So let's just write some. And it should be written in pure JavaScript. And it should solve a bunch of client-side security issues, including DOM XSS, including uh, persistent XSS, including XSS in on the offline applications, including DOM clobbering, and so on. So let's just do this. And the reason for there, why we have to do this, is that I do believe that there is a problem with what I love believe to call, what I like to call knowledge parity. I believe that the server cannot single-handedly solve cross-site scripting because the server does not really know what the client is capable of. The server cannot know that. Yes, you can create a very restrictive filtering library on the server, but the filtering library never really knows what kind of capabilities the client actually has. It cannot know that. So it can never give you 100% protection because it's not not really aware of the capabilities the browser has. If you remember the inner HTML talk that I gave two years ago, that was exactly that problem. The server did not know what the client is capable of, what kind of quirks the client has, and all of a sudden you have a universal bypass, and universal bypasses are never good. And there's more scenarios where you would want to use something like this and where you do not even have a server that can protect you. Think about offline applications that are syncing each other. Think about apps and widgets that are also not talking to servers but just to themselves or other apps and widgets. And most importantly, think, for example, about web crypto. So in web crypto, the server wouldn't even see something that is decrypted and scannable. It doesn't have a chance to do so. If it has, then something is severely broken. So only the browser itself, who is capable of decrypting this stuff, can see this thing. But what then? Um, there is no possibility to send it back to the server and have it scan for XSS or anything else. You have to solve the problem of XSS in the client. You cannot always throw things in the iframe sandbox, and also the iframe sandbox, so it's not, iframe sandbox is not perfect. And the best example for this is Web Crypto, like, for example, the uh, browser extension Mailvelope that is providing you with PGP in the browser. They need software like that. They need a client-side XSS filter. 
Um, just to kind of underline it again, that it's because it's so really important, server-side access protection does work to a certain degree, but it cannot guarantee 100% safety. It's impossible by design because the server cannot know what the client is capable of and will never, because otherwise the client would be the server and you have this kind of emulation dilemma. So what I was planning to do was to create a very simple API, an API that, that anybody can use just like easily, just like include the script and do stuff and get started. So my goal was to have an API that just like says, okay, include the script and have one method that is being called and that one method is doing all the dirty work with the safe default. So I would go ahead and say, hey, include the purify.js, then call the sanitize method of the DOM purify object, throw in some really, really nasty, really dirty HTML, and all you can get out is clean HTML that's not going to do anything to your application, not anything bad. And then I also said, like, yeah, it might be nice to be able to configure it and give it more flags and make it compatible with this library and that library. And gradually I did that. And uh, then that happened. Another, another goal that I had was, for example, to make sure that contrary to a bunch of server-side libraries, the DOM purify should be as tolerant as possible. It should be supporting everything, SVG, MathML, HTML, whatever you could think of. Everything should go in there, and it should always get you as much as possible. It shouldn't be at least as restrictive as possible to kind of make sure that your content that you're submitting and that you're sanitizing using DOM Purify is almost never touched, almost never crippled, almost never ruined, because I do believe that this is extremely important. If you do have false alerts in your filtering library, you will eventually be tempted to get rid of the filter filtering library because you cannot use it because it's crippling your content, and that is bad for everyone. And I also decided that it should be working with the Shadow DOM and future implementations of what we're going to see in the DOM, so to be as compatible as possible and to be as nice and convenient as possible. To do that, my plan was to use the features that the browser is already giving us. And one of these features is to use document implementation. Document implementation gives us the possibility to create a fresh DOM. And with a fresh DOM, we can do a lot of things. So I was using document implementation, create HTML document, threw in some dirty HTML, iterated over it with a node iterator, and then decided element by element if that element is good or bad, if it's matching my whitelist or not, if that attribute is matching my whitelist or not, if that value is OK, and then leave it in or throw it out. And finally, take the tree, re-serialize it, and give it back to the DOM that was using it, and thereby have good security. It sounds quite easy, because you would assume that those methods are actually friendly and that they do things that you might be able to predict. It sounds easy, right? You just like throw it in, you iterate over it, throw all the bad stuff, whoops, done. However, the DOM is the DOM, and the DOM decided to take revenge on us and decided to be nasty. So it was not as easy as I thought, and there was a lot of, yeah, there were a lot of problems that we ran into. And what I'm going to do right now is tell you about these problems because I think these problems are pretty generalizable and have some interesting content, some interesting lessons to learn. Let's have a close look at these, and let's have a close look at those bypasses that were created by, well, me, different other testers, a bunch of people that were helping and kind of kind of trying to break DOM Purify, which they managed several times, and uh, who did an awesome job in doing so, and then we were able to fix those things. The first bypass was, guess what, DOM clobbering based. So before we released DOM Purify as like even a pre-alpha, um, I wrote to some people, I had said, guys, I wrote a tool and I would really like if you could break it, uh, do you mind spending some time? And people luckily did, and that was great. So the first, one of the first bypasses that was coming in was the thing that we can see down here. Diff on click alert zero, form on submit alert one, then input name parent node one, two, three. And you might ask yourself like, what, what, is, what is that? Why is, why is that a problem? Well, the problem is, that if you have a form and that form has an input and that input has a name, then that input will create, of course, a reference for itself. And that name will, of course, have the name of that reference. And that means that potentially other elements that are kind of pre-assigned to that, native elements that are pre-assigned to that will be overwritten by that. So an input applied with the name parent node will actually overwrite its very own parent node property. So all of a sudden, the input doesn't have a parent node er uh, anymore, but the parent node is the input itself. It overrides its own parent node with itself. And that's, of course, a catastrophe if you have a DOM tree and you're iterating over the DOM tree and you get stuck in a position where the element is its very own parent node because then the iterator is going to stumble and is going to fall, and eventually that stuff that is being returned is incomplete, the checks are incomplete, and you have an XSS. 
And that is exactly what happened to us. We had an XSS and that sucked. So what we did here was just like to make sure that this cannot really happen and that we check every single property that we use if it's really the property that we use. And if we realize that child.parent node equals equals child, then we have a problem. And then we need to stop. And then we just say, stop, here is an attack. We cannot do this anymore. Let's throw the whole thing out because that's actually a security risk. So we did that, and then it was fine. The next attack was even more advanced and even more nasty. So someone came up with the idea of clobbering attributes. So what was happening here, we got, a, again, a form element. And the form element, again, got a mouse over attribute or whatever you could use here. And then it had an input element. And that input element was applied with a name, and the name was attributes. So since I was also sanitizing attributes of every element, someone came up with the idea of just simply saying, yeah, then I'm going to create an element that is called attributes. So it's going to overwrite the attributes collection, and it's not iteratable anymore, and the parser will crash, and something will go wrong, and you might have an XSS. And hell, we did. So that was the next XSS. So what I was doing here was thinking that I'm very smart, which in this particular situation I definitely was not, because I thought that it might make sense to check if attributes is really a collection or if it's not, because if it's not a collection, then something went wrong and something broke the code, and we might face a cross scripting problem. So what I was doing here, and that is the actual stupid part for me, is that I was checking whether the type of element attributes item is a function because I was assuming that it has to be a collection and a collection has an item function and if that item function is there then it's definitely a collection and I can move on. But oh my god I was so wrong. What happened was that the next attack was simply using two input elements and each of those two input elements had a name and that name was the same. It was again attributes. That was creating a node collection. And in a node collection, you also have a valid collection that also comes with an item method. So my check was garbage. And checking for the item method was a complete fail. And it passed this check and thereby managed again to override the attributes collection and thereby again introduce the cross-site scripting. Damn it. Well, there was more attacks. Um, in the very beginning of the early days of the pre-alpha, it turns out that, for example, uh, in some situations, if you use non-existing attributes, like a wow attribute or something like that, that sometimes they would stick, sometimes they wouldn't, sometimes they would appear, sometimes they would disappear, sometimes they would be detected, sometimes they would be thrown out. And I really didn't see the systematics of this first. I was like, why does it sometimes work like this and sometimes work like that? And it didn't come to me first, but the reason why this was weird was the internal ordering of the attributes that the browser did. So attributes are being ordered depending on the browser by name or sometimes by occurrence. If you, for example, use our inner HTML tool and uh, take a bunch of markup with attributes that start with different letters, you will see that some browsers sort those attributes in a different way than other browsers in the resulting markup. So there is, again, bug potential. And yes. That was, of course, backfiring, and it was backfiring dramatically because what I did first, and it was fundamentally wrong, and Gareth actually told me not to do it, was I was iterating over those attributes by their original order. So I was taking the first attribute and the second attribute and the third attribute and iterating over them and checking all of them and hoping that everything was fine, but it wasn't. Because if I found, or if Dom Pure, if I found an attribute that was, that was foul and that was stinky, it would throw it out. But what I didn't consider in this particular situation is that throwing out an attribute is changing the internal index. So all the other attributes that are following afterwards are going to kind of slip to the former index and become the first index, at least the next one. And thereby, my iterator again starts stumbling, and I kind of miss things, and we have another XSS. So what is the right way? And like I said, Gareth found this trick. Um, the right way would be to just like iterate backwards, to take the elements take the length of the elements collection uh, subtracted by one and then start iterating from there and remove those attributes from the back and not from the front because then the index doesn't have to change and if the index doesn't have to change there is no rearranging and there is no potential to actually miss attributes and that is good and now we're safe against this kind of attack. And another really nasty thing that was happening that was document clobbering, just like clobbering around in document itself and just like ruining everything. And that is still such a big problem in so many web applications because nobody is prepared for this kind of attack. Let's consider you have an image element and you give that image a source and you call it source blah or whatever, then you give it a name. And then you say name equals get element by ed. Guess what's going to happen? What is going to happen is that the parser is going to create a reference in document and is going to overwrite the existing function or the existing method get element by ID with that image. 
So if, if you then go ahead and try to execute document get element by ID, your engine will say like, ah, no, that is not possible because it's not a function, it's an image object, and that really sucks. The same you can do, for example, with image name active element. You can do the same with image name body, and then all of a sudden you don't have a document body anymore because the document body is that image. So it's kind of resembling the attack that we saw very early where we were overwriting an element's parent node with itself, but here we kind of overwrite the whole document's parent node. We just go ahead and overwrite body by just saying image name body. And again, we kind of make the parser stumble, we make the iterator stumble, and we had another XSS, so we had to fix this as well. And image name body was actually quite hard to fix. That really sucked. But well, there's even more. Um, Alex found out that mutation XSS is still a huge issue in the DOM, even in modern browsers, not only in older IEs. And that, again, was backfiring and causing problems for us. Because, well, if we iterate over things and have a look at those things, and we do it in the client, not even on the server, and then we assume that this is actually the stuff we want to see because we are in the client already and we know all the capabilities because we are the client. However, this was not true in every single situation. And in Internet Explorer, there was a bypass that was using the listing element that we already know from the MXSS presentations that was encoding certain payload and then using other payload that was unencoded and it's again, was again bypassing the parser, bypassing the iterator and causing an XSS. We also learned that, for example, using non-standard, non-existing attributes like the it slash attribute will again cause the parser to stumble and will cause a bypass. And then last but not least, and that was found by Tom Ritter, um, and there was an amazing bug that only works in Chrome, that up to a certain point, if you take a string of HTML and you put certain characters in there, like, for example, the Unicode representation of the paragraph separator or the line separator, which is the backslash U 2028 or 2029, then it will not hurt you in any context. But if you take this thing and then actually move along and use it in conjunction with, for example, document write or inner HTML, then the browser, and this is a bug in my opinion, then the browser will turn it into the actual character. And once it's being turned into the actual character and it's part of the protocol, it will not be evaluated and the protocol will remain intact and we have yet another cross-site scripting attack. So this was, again, very, very hard and very painful to fix, but we managed to fix it and I haven't seen any bypasses of that kind thus far. So you can see it's not that easy and the topic of security in the DOM doesn't really exist in a way that we expect it to exist. And we shouldn't even expect it to exist like that because the DOM was never written with security in mind. It's basically a glue between the JavaScript and the HTML, and that's what it should be, not a security zone. When we do actually do security critical stuff in the DOM, we need to see, keep certain things in mind. Um, we need to keep DOM clobbering in mind, and that means that we need to keep in mind that we need to verify the properties. If we work with a property, we need to make sure that the property is really the property we were working with and not something else that has been overwritten by some harmless-looking markup. We have to put in, uh, keep in mind that there is mutating values and that there's MXSS and that things might look different after first access and might look even more different after second access. We also need to keep in mind that protocol handlers are not always protocol handlers, but even if they're kind of disturbed by Unicode characters or other white space, then at some point this white space will just disappear, not be evaluated, and then we have the working protocol handler, although we didn't have it before. We need to make sure if we iterate over things that we iterate in the right order, we need to verify changes, we need to verify and verify all the time, and verification is everything. So, And the most important thing is that we also properly react to anomalies, because what we did in the very beginning with DOM Purifier was just like to throw in exceptions, like, yeah, that's not cool, but what you should have done in the very beginning, what we're doing now is to make sure that whenever there is something weird, whenever there is something fishy, we throw it out. We just like say, okay, this is not normal, this is not what we expect, out with you, and that works, in my opinion, quite well. So I do believe that with Dom Purify, without wanting to do too much advertising, we came quite far. Of course, there is no 100% security yet, and there will never be, but we can just go so far and kind of defend against the attacks that we know, and we know a bunch of them meanwhile. One of these gaps that is keeping us from reaching 100% and will always be keeping us from reaching 100% is libraries. There's, for example, jQuery. I do not really like jQuery, and I'm not going to read that last line right now because you can read it yourself. Um, jQuery is not really your best friend when coming to DOM security. It absolutely is not. Let's have a look why. Or first, let's have a look how many people are actually using jQuery. According to a bunch of websites that are keen with numbers, um, 
a large, large, large quantity of the internet is using jQuery. According to this page, it's actually 18% of the entire internet, which is like millions of millions and billions of pages that are using this library. And well, they should, because it's not the worst, but when you talk about security, it's also not the best. Let's have a look why. I mean, we just saw that jQuery is used a lot. It's about a fifth of the entire internet. And jQuery doesn't really have the best cross-site scripting past. Um, most of you might remember the location hash debacle, um, the problems with the element factory. There was those issues with jQuery migrate when we made really good friends with the jQuery developers. Um, but it gets worse because there is something that they haven't fixed yet and that they're not about to fix, so we had to fix it for them. And that is a problem with jQuery being smart in certain situations where it shouldn't be smart. So let's have a look at this string of markup that we can see at the bottom of the page. We see an option element, and inside this option element, we see a style element. Now then we see a closing option element. And we might think, OK, no, since the option first opened and then the option closes, the style would kind of be terminated by the closing option, and then things might get tricky. However, this is not the point. Style is pretty strong, and style can only be closed by closing style. So that means that the closing option is actually garbage CSS. It's part of the content of the style element. We have a closing select then, but it's also not a closing select. It's part of the style. We see a B element and an image element with an error handler. But then we see the closing style element, and then we finally leave the style context again. And then we see the closing option. So that means we have an option element, and the content of that option is basically a style element that is filled with garbage. And that's not going to hurt anyone. That's not bad. And this will never alert anything, which is good. But the problem is, technically, this vector is harmless. But when you take jQuery into the example, uh, into, the, into the equation, then it's not anymore. Because jQuery will actually turn this thing into an attack. Um, if I remember correctly, this attack was discovered by Roman. And it was amazing. And it was so hard to fix. And I had such a hard time to actually get by and make sure that dump your device is also safe when jQuery is part of the equation. And I need to find out what's actually going on here. What is going on here is jQuery trying to be smart and trying to make sure that in certain situations, elements that appear to be incomplete will actually be auto-completed by a red map. So it says, like, hey, my parser just found an option, and this is like an orphaned option, and nobody likes orphans. Oh, no, I didn't say that. This is an orphaned option, and nobody likes to be an orphan. And we need to make sure that this object, that this element is actually being wrapped by what it's expected to be as a parent element. So it's just like, hey, option, you shouldn't be alone here. You should be given a select, because that is where you belong. And it wraps the whole thing into a select. Now, the problem is that the wrapping is not really looking forward too much to what is happening after the option. So here we can see the original vector. So we see the option, the style, the option, the select, and so on. The style ends, and then the actual option ends. But the result, after jQuery treating it, is that we have a select that contains the option that contains an empty style, that closes the option, that closes the select, that has a B element, and then really has the image element. So jQuery is extracting the payload from the string and putting it in a position in the DOM where it actually evaluates and executes. And that's not good. So we had to fix that. We had to kind of invent a mode that's just like, OK, if you use this mode, then jQuery's, uh, then DOM purify is actually safe in combination with jQuery, even if that is hard. And there's more. Um, we realized the same thing, for example, when talking about template elements. So template elements that are introducing a shadow DOM or the root of a shadow DOM or the possibility to, for a template that, that can be applied with a shadow DOM, um, they are special as well. And we wanted to be compatible with them because that's the future. And we realized that if we have a template element that has child elements that might be used in a template and then maybe later in an attack, then it doesn't have any child nodes. But you first have to go into the content property and from that content property into the child nodes array or into the child nodes correction and then clean those. And then be aware that inside these child nodes, there might be another template element that contains another template element that contains another template element. So it has to be recursive to be able to provide holistic protection. So we're almost done with the presentation. We're getting to the last slides. Protect thyself. So what can we do to actually protect ourselves? Well, at the classic server-side level, um, we can still do the things that we did before. We can apply classic cross-site scripting protection, um, but it is not enough for complex client-side, framework-driven, um, potentially not even server-bound applications anymore. We have to make sure, for example, that ID and name attributes have to be removed from user-generated markup because they do bad stuff, or they have to be isolated in an iframe sandbox, but that's also not always possible.
Class attributes can also get dangerous as soon as JavaScript model view controller frameworks are mixed and have a look at the mustache security wiki because there's many examples where the class attribute executes arbitrary code. That is a bad idea. And what I can just not tell often enough is do not build blacklists because blacklists are going to bite you in the butt. It's not, there is absolutely nothing that will save you when you use and build a blacklist. They cannot work. Whitelists are the only working approach. You have to know before what you want to allow, and all the rest has to go out. It can be a lot that you allow. It can be a lot that you permit. But you cannot use blacklists. You cannot forbid stuff. You have to allow stuff, and this is the right way. Well, on the client side level, my personal opinion is that clobbering is the biggest risk so far because clobbering has phenomena or shows effects that we cannot really estimate right now. We can see, okay, hey, I didn't see this one uh, as a clobbering attack, but it is. Damn it, what to do now? I had a look at many other client-side filtering tools that exist, and guess what? Clobbering is a problem. So, Clobbering even happens when you use document implementation, and clobbering even happens if you take your markup and serialize it with or unserialize it, for example, with a DOM parser. It still happens. It still clobbers. There is no safe way of having dirty HTML that is not being clobbered. I do believe that in the next years, classic cross-site scripting bugs that are triggerable by get URL via forms, they will mostly disappear. And they will not be found anymore because there's enough protections on the side, like CSP and other tools that you can use to protect your server-side applications that will get rid of these bugs and make sure that even if they are still there, they will be harmless unless you find a spectacular CSP bypass. What I believe, however, is that the future of web security will heavily involve client-side security, so it's important to have a look at that stuff now and learn those tricks now and be aware of what the DOM actually does and what it doesn't do and keep track of the development of the DOM. So we've reached a conclusion, and the conclusion is simple because it just says proper DOM security is hard. Oh my god, what a kind of uh, learning here. And unfortunately, understanding the DOM is often hard as well. Sometimes traversal fails, transactions fail, things are counterintuitive, elements disappear, new elements pop up. You never know. It's still the DOM. And I do believe that nowadays in a penetration test, without using a very, very strong nut string JavaScript and DOM debugger, you won't get very far. And I saw myself sitting hours in front of an application, just like fighting myself through mountains of mountains of JavaScript and using breakpoints just to find out what actually happens in the DOM. And browsers still do their own thing here and there, so don't underestimate the importance of browser security research because there's always artifacts and there's always interesting behaviors that we can make use of. And I do believe that there is the first baby steps that have already been made in the right direction. We see more good quality documentation. We see more good libraries. Um, we do see that browsers are meanwhile actually eager to fix standard deviations, which is a good thing. Um, we started with DOM Purify, now we have JPurify, which is specifically designed for saving jQuery from being too vulnerable by just like patching all the DOM access things. But I think we still need something like a community wiki. We need like a place where we can talk about, discuss, document, look up, and research new ways of finding quirky behavior in the DOM artifacts in the DOM. We don't have anything like that yet, and I think we need it. Um, we set up the XSS challenge wiki to at least document all the interesting vectors that were coming out of XSS challenges, but I think that's still not enough. We need something bigger than that, and we need to build it at some point and collect all the data there to give people the possibility to actually actively and reasonably do security in the DOM. There are features coming every day, and the DOM is growing every day, and the DOM develops extremely fast, and I do believe that it's one of the fastest things developing in the WWW right now, so we need to keep an eye on that, and it's got to be going to stay exciting. That's it. That's the end. Now it's time for questions or comments or criticism. Thanks a lot. And absolute special thanks to all those guys and all the folks that were uh, helping with DOM Purify. They were finding bugs. They were testing against DOM Purify. And they were kind of, kind of pushing us to the stage where we are right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mario, for giving us such a nice talk on the and clarifying the DOM security, and obviously you've shown a very nice graph about the jQuery, and seriously, we think it's the jQuery is evil for the security. So uh, I have sent you one link for the questions. There are, we have two questions. Yes, I just clicked that link. Yep. Um, here's one question from NetGhost, and NetGhost is asking, how can we automate the process of finding clobbering issues? Um, I have a good answer for that, and that is, I don't know. <laughs> Tell me, I have no idea. Um, I think this whole thing is not really young, but it's still complex. So we just like need to need to be able to to find ways of automating that, of of, of first defining what we're actually looking for, because before we don't know what we're actually looking for, we cannot automate the process of finding it. So 
that might be something that could be discussed in such a DOM security wiki that I was mentioning that we don't have yet. Probably a very unsatisfying answer, but that's all I got. And the other question I see here is from Anil. Um, I'm trying to execute JS code via URL in an open redirection scenario managed to bypass filter as it's redirecting to arbitrary URL, but when I pass JavaScript JS code, Firefox returning corrupted content error message. Not able to understand what's going on. Well, what I think is happening here is that the server is triggering that redirect to the JavaScript URI and that the server is delivering corrupted content to the browser that it cannot parse. So try working with data URIs or try working on with other URI schematas, but I'm not really sure if JavaScript is going to get you far in this particular situation. Also try other browsers, try older browsers, try older IE, maybe something goes there. But I think it's fairly hard to get around this problem. One thing that you could have a look at, for example, however, is the XSS challenge wiki, because one of the challenges was actually covering a similar problem. Um, I think it was the mini XSS puzzle one or puzzle two. Have a look at this. Maybe this actually helps you. Okay. So thank you for everyone for joining Garage for Hackers Venture Das Webcast series, and thank you Mario for giving us such a nice talk and uh, we're clearing a lot of things regarding DOM security. And I would like to announce there's a next topic of Rancher Das webcast series on the mobile application. Very soon we are going to release the name of the author on our page, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can join uh, Mario's Twitter account. You can ask uh, any questions to, on Twitter and his email ID. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining this. All right, thank you.